My name is Riaz Patel. Um, I'm a showrunner here in Hollywood, um, and I'm on the Bell Advisory Council, and have been for many years because I believe in the power of entertainment to transform. Um, that it's so often in an information age, I think people are resistant to being taught, but they're okay if it's caught, and that's sort of what entertainment does. Um, for the past seven years, I've been working on a project called Connect Effect, which is a live, in-person event that takes an audience of strangers, and in 60 minutes, it hard resets their humanity across divides, across generations, across backgrounds, so they're able to actually talk to each other in the real world and move away from the edits of each other in the screen world. And so that's sort of why I've met so many of you people in this bridging world. Um, but what's interesting about what we're chatting is that so often have conversations about what entertainment should do and what creative should do. And then there's a, those of us who are in the room and it's, it's a job and it's a job with pressures. And so what I hope to do here is give you a little bit of a, of a glimpse behind the realities of making some of these narrative changes because there are agents there, there are, there are executives, they're changing executives of networks every single week. And it's very hard to navigate. So hopefully give you a sense of sort of what is possible. Um, but for my first twist, um, you two know each other. And you know each other for a while, so rather than you introduce yourselves, I'm going to have you introduce each other. Because it's actually hard to boast about yourself, but I think you'll get a much better sense of who they are when someone else is boasting for them. This so might, This might be the shortest panel of the bunch if I, <laughs> if I screw this up. Uh, I've known Joel. Joel and I uh, worked together on a police show called Rizzolian Isles many years ago. And we used to walk around the Paramount lot and say, how do we fix this show? And that turned into, how do we fix the country? <laughs> right? The show wasn't fixable. No. That's fine. <laughs> and we've done a great job with the country. <laughs> That's why we're all here. <laughs> um, Joel's one of the most thoughtful writers I know in the world of drama. Um, responsible for The Americans, um, Fosse Verdon, uh, Emmy winner for... The Americans. The Americans. Um, and um, when we talked about putting this panel together, I thought, well, Joel's one of the most thoughtful people. We, we worked together on, on various other developmental programs, and the conversations end up being about the very thing that we're talking about today, which is, this is fixable. Like, how do we, what's the first step? How do we get there? And we never got to the actual work, I don't think, because we were doing that conversation, right? But, um, but Joel is, uh, is one of the people that's really thinking about how to write these nuanced characters that are not divisive, but in fact, make people think about our differences. Well, that's very kind. Dave uh, has became a wonderful friend on that show, and we did take some great walks and stayed in touch. Uh, Dave is also, uh, one of the most successful comedy writer, producer, showrunners in town, currently helping to run The Connors at ABC. But you can IMDb him and, and see how much he's done and how much joy and laughter he's given you all. But in his spare time, he decided it would be fun to go get a PhD in psychology with a, special, <laughs> with a uh, specialization in media studies. So he's really studied this stuff. And um, I look forward to hearing what he has to say today. My first, so. I will say, being creative in Hollywood, there is a ton of pressure to toe the line, and that there is one narrative. And by even attempting to bridge, and Steve and I have had conversations about this, you put your neck on a chopping block. And I've had many, many reactions in interviews where people say, like, what are you doing bridging with that side? Why are you giving a platform to white supremacy? Which was ironic that I was doing that. Why is it important to both of you, at this level of success, to do this work when it's so much easier to just stay the course? Well, I think because we have a unique opportunity to do this. Um, and I know we have a lot of you know, entertainment industry folks here today. So I think you're probably thinking the same thing that I thought when I first went down this, this road, which is, OK, we're going to decrease conflict in storytelling. Well, that sounds like a recipe for disaster, right? <laughs> so, um, but I'm glad I can say to you today that um, that's not really what we're pitching. And as we continue in this conversation that we have, we're going to talk about the fairly simple things that content creators can do to help ameliorate this situation we found ourselves in. So, you know, I, I think I can 
I'm not going to speak for Joel, but I think we found that, well, we, we really, you know, people are watching thousands of hours of scripted content a year. There's a landscape of cultural norms that emerges from all of that times 330 million people. We have an opportunity to change the cultural norms, and it's not that difficult. And when I came to realize that, I thought, well, we have to act. We have to do something. Yeah, I'll just add, I think at its best, you know, storytelling does not need to be in conflict at all with this goal. In fact, it doesn't have to struggle with this goal. Storytelling is enough of a struggle as it is. And I think, for me, to tell good, interesting stories, you have to have good, interesting characters. And to write good, interesting characters, you have to understand them. And you can't stand in judgment of your characters. The minute you start judging your characters, the minute they become is the minute they become two-dimensional. That doesn't mean that there can't be good characters and, and evil characters or characters who are doing bad things. What it means is we see the reasons for their thinking. We understand the reasons for their actions. And that is what makes characters deep and interesting, and that is what makes character conflicts deep and interesting. That's what makes drama compelling. So, so James Bond shouldn't have a pumpkin latte with whoever's going to blow up the world? <laughs> Well, uh, I think there's a place there's a place for James Bond movies and stories, and they're a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of digging deeper, uh, I think that the challenge is how can we tell stories that are as fun and as compelling, but create nuance. And those are the stories. You know, the, the fun about James Bond is it transports us. But the value of true entertainment, entertainment that bridges, is that it transforms us. And in order to transform, the characters have to transform, because we put ourselves into the seats of the characters. So what we're looking for are stories where characters struggle and, in a tragedy, fail, and in, uh, in a hero's journey, succeed. But that success always comes with a transformation, which is a kind of destruction of the self that existed before, uh, a, 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 a willingness for the character to ultimately let go of the things that they thought defined them and to grow into a new place. And that's what we all have to do. And the power of story is that we can be transported and watch that in a, in a fictional world and then take it back into our own lives. Can I just say transported is such a key word yes. here. The actual academic term for being totally immersed in a story when you're oblivious to the time on the wall and you're really in it, experiencing it from the character's POV, is called transportation. And the guy that, that coined that term, Gehrig, uh, he was really making the analogy to literally traveling. So when you go to a foreign country and you come back, you're not the same. You've experienced something, the way other people live, that changes you a little bit when you come back. That's kind of the excitement and the beauty of travel, right? Well, the same thing happens in stories. Like, it's a tremendous trap door. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a back way into the human mind that is completely unique, which is that once we experience that immersion from another character's POV, we come back slightly changed. And in that, for content creators, is a tremendous responsibility. And that's and we were talking before that the places where we give over our ego are becoming rarer and rarer. That there's very few places that we go in armed with the information that we have, which is infinite, where we're not going in a bit like this. And one of the only times is when you either sit in a dark theater or you sit in front of, of, of a TV screen or you're in a play. And so that idea of transportation it maybe happened in churches and synagogues for people who do that, but now it's so rare to give over of the ego. When you're talking about getting over the ego in a world where the attention span gets shorter and shorter, how does that impact your creative process for the two of you? Because again, you've got now this much time to get someone to watch this channel as opposed to the 785 million other options that they have. How does that impact your creative process? Well, you, you can't let it impact mm -hmm. your creative process. You can't give in to that pressure. You know, when you were talking about how you sit, the places where we sit and we give ourselves over, I, I was thinking of the other place where, where we sit and try to, to 
put down our fists and uh, be open and be humble, and that's when you're sitting in front of the blank page or the blank screen. <laughs> and you you just have to be willing to accept that you may fail and you may fall on your face, uh, and you have to be humble and you have to listen to yourself and hope that you hear what the audience may hear and then follow uh, the most important rule, which is not to be boring. You know, something just occurred to me, mm -hmm. actually. Um, the, you know, there's a thing called contact theory, which uh, is an old psychological theory, which says that one of the ways that you change people's minds is you you get in contact with them. You literally sit down and have a conversation. And that's been shown over and over again to be one of the ways that you get people to drop these preconceived notions and actually relate to each other. So then all of a sudden, here comes television, post that theory, and the new theory is parasocial contact hypothesis, right? Coming into contact with characters. And the interesting thing about sitting down to a blank page, I was just thinking, is that we kind of have to do the same thing as creators, which is, we're going to write a character here or characters that we don't agree with, but I want to listen to their viewpoint and respect the emotional truth that they're coming from. So in a weird way, the blank page is that contact hypothesis because you sit and you listen to the character that you're going to write. If you're going to write it convincingly, right? Nobody wants to write, you know, black and white characters. So in a weird way, you just, oh, good content creators, Joel, <laughs> um, sit down and actually get to know that person that they may not completely agree with, who's going to be multi-dimensional anyway, right? You're not going to completely agree or disagree. But, um, and that's kind of a nice metaphor for something that we all kind of have to do, which is to go in with a blank page when we're considering mm -hmm. other people. What do you think industry-wise could be done? What do you think should be done to create more narratives of us? And I think often when, and I remember Stephen and I had this conversation, the idea of bridging, when you walk into a pitch room, whenever someone asks me about bridging, they think it's left and right. And I think we're all stuck in that binary mindset that there's only a bridging between a left and a right. And that becomes a non-starter really fast. And, and behind closed doors, no one's watching, that's a non-starter. And so this idea of what is possible, what kind of bridges are possible in these pitch rooms? Because that's, that's the reality of it, is that we stand in front of that computer, we pour our hearts out. Generally, your agent tells you it's terrible. My agent still terrifies me when I pitch her. I've had her for 14 years, and she's still the hardest person to pitch. Then you go into the room, and you don't know what the marketing agenda is. You don't know who just came in as the head of it, who's gutted all the programming before. But what is It's possible? a terrible business. Can we all agree on it's that? It's a horrific it's business. awful, awful way to make it. Okay. But, but navigating that, what do you think is possible? What do you think creators should do? And what do you think is possible for them to do? And then, conversely, what is, what is hard to do? Well, uh, I will say that we ha not only do we have to write stories that show us respectfully disagreeing, but the social science says there's another way to do this, too. So essentially what we're talking about is modeling. Right? So the way that we learn, uh, we have first-hand experience, we touch the fire, we don't do that again. But most of our learning comes through modeling the people in our environment. And again, our environment now extends to all of the media that we watch. So what we're really talking about is helping to give America a better model of how people disagree. That can be done in the very small moments of shows. It doesn't have to be the central thing about holding hands and skipping through a meadow. It's in these little moments, and there's, you find these little moments in all kinds of TV shows and movies, where we show people with a gap in between. And again, it doesn't have to be left and right. It often is. It doesn't have to be. And to show that they are going to, A, disagree, do it respectfully, maybe show that they're not all of one thing or another, that people are multidimensional, which is one of the myths that has sprung up. It doesn't take only the big stories. It takes little moments in a lot of the stories. So what we do is we put it in the water. There is a way to behave with people that you don't necessarily agree with. And that's how we change what people are modeling, the kind of behavior, because they've learned a terrible thing through the algorithms, through news that divides for profit. We have to use storytelling to say, no, that's not how you behave. 
here's how you behave. And we do it in little ways that are, that, that are not preachy, but just it gives people a chance to see over their thousands of hours of scripted stuff that they're consuming. That's how you behave with somebody you don't agree with. Joel, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, would, I think that's great. And I think also there's a, there's a broader way to do it too, which again goes to having compassion and understanding for your characters and seeing characters who may disagree and focusing not necessarily on, on how they disagree, but rather on their common humanity sure. mm -hmm. and how, how they can overcome things together or overcome one another. Uh, through each other, or fail to do so. All of those are powerful stories. And, um, you know, fortunately, drama also works for us here. There's no compelling story of two people who agree with each other and then set out on their agreement and wind up agreeing with each other. Story. It's Terrible boring. Story. Bad. It's boring. And in fact, our lives would be boring if we spent them only with people who we agree with. There would be no growth there. And look, the drama is in the struggle. And not struggling is very, um, very enticing to not struggle. Who wants to struggle, right? The only problem is, without struggle, life gets pretty boring pretty fast. It's, it's interesting that in, in the screen world with social media and the feeds, everyone, I call it the screen world squish, that everyone gets squished down to a label, an issue gets squished down to binary, and people will go through their feeds and see thousands of posts, and yet they'll give over 12 hours to a scripted series and binge watch it and the whole day goes by. I think as people, we want that, and that's what we connect to much more empathically. What sorts of characters do you think we want? We should see more of? What sorts of characters, what sorts of situations do you think that the American people should see more of to be able to change that narrative of everyone is squished, everyone is binary? What sorts of situations do you think aren't there that we should put out more in the market? Well, obviously, Joe Weisberg and I felt strongly that um, serial killer would be interesting to humanize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they, they don't get enough screen time. I, 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 Who are they really? If I had to, uh, look, if, if there were an easy answer to that, yeah. I'd be telling you what the next show is. Um, for, you know, I think the, the hope is maybe somebody here will find their own answer to that. I think we've all got to find our answers to that, and that's that's inside the hearts of every writer, director, actor, creator, producer, and the hope is that y you do it in a, a full way and in a human way, rather than looking to have sort of, uh, to follow excitement, rather than to follow what's deeply compelling. That's exciting, interesting, and just elaborate on that, in terms of when people follow excitement, what happens? in your opinion? I think there are sometimes easy choices that lead to short-term results, um, but... They're usually given as network notes. <laughs> well, Often they are given as network notes, that this happened in the news, let's put it in here in this scene right now. And by the way, yeah. that may work great. Yeah. The challenge is, how can you then do that in, in a way that is compelling, emotional, relatable, and more importantly, true to your character? Hmm. I think characters that are surprising really help us, right, too. We talked about multidimensionality. I mean, nobody here is all left, all right, all religious, all non-religious. Everybody's got, you know, it's the smorgasbord that you take one of that, I'll take that works for me, that never quite worked for me. So doing a better job in, in content creation to create characters that are like that helps to spell the notions of the us and them. And also, it's better storytelling yeah. because it's better. because people, we're, we're surprising beings. And so when somebody out of nowhere be, behind the counter says, you can have the mac and cheese and the yams, that's surprising. You weren't expecting that. It's a good story. When somebody's mom says, uh, uh, let me tell you a story from my childhood, instead of immediately jumping to the reaction, because that's a good story. You didn't expect that. You didn't see it coming. So I think in so many ways, good storytelling, human storytelling, can, it, it can be our guide. 
it, it also drills down to the psychology of it too, which is sometimes you just have to go deeper in story. So um, when we rebooted the Roseanne show from the sitcom from the 90s, and uh, Roseanne Barr was in public a Trump supporter, and we thought, well, we probably can't run from that because it's everybody knows it. So let's use it mm -hmm. and let's try to get to the sort of the bottom of these kinds of disagreements and see if we can't bring everybody into the tent, left and right. That was the experiment of that pilot. And when she and Lori Metcalf was playing the, the Hillary Clinton supporter in that pilot. And when they got into it, they hadn't we played that they hadn't spoken in years because of this kind of divide. Mm -hmm. And when they really got into it, the differences just dissolved a little bit. Roseanne was a Trump supporter because she latched on to something he said in a speech about bringing jobs back. Now, the reality of it or whatever, we, that's another debate for another time. But she was scared, that character was scared that she wasn't going to have a job going into her old age and she wouldn't be able to take care of herself. Well, that's not evil, is it? That's simply the fear that's underneath all of this. And when you get to that psychological level, you're like, well, okay, I'm not fearful of that. We, let's have a discussion about jobs and why that's a real promise or it's not a real promise or whatever. But sometimes I think drilling down to the psychology of it, which always is gonna come down to mostly fear, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that, I think that's very helpful. And again, that's where dimensionalized characters come from. So win-win. Yeah. What we, we were talking earlier, we're all fairly optimistic about what can be done. And so what do you think, I'll start with you, Dave, what do you think storytellers could be doing differently to make these changes? Let me, let me first say why it is I'm optimistic about do, it. Please. Yeah. I'm optimistic because the thing that we're talking about doing has a track record and it has an extensive track record. So very quickly, I'm gonna tell you about a guy named Miguel Sabado, who's a Mexican producer. And back in the 70s in Mexico, he was alarmed by the fact that they had a high level of illiteracy. And there were these government programs that nobody availed themselves of. People just didn't go do it. So he used Albert Bandura, psychologist from Stanford who created something called social cognitive theory, talks about how people model things in their environment. He used that science and he created a radio drama about this. And one of the characters had low literacy. And it wasn't preachy and it wasn't telling anybody what to do. It was modeling somebody who went and got help. And, and they had a between a 30 and 40% rise in enrollment and literacy programs. He made a giant, a giant change in literacy through a radio soap opera. He then, over the years, did a bunch more of these shows. He did 30 or 40 of these things and tackled everything from um, uh, domestic violence to HIV prevention during the 80s. And it turned out to be a tremendous boon, right? And um, an organization called PCI took this up and did it around the world. Some of you might be familiar with PCI. Um, and they've made huge differences in um, HIV prevention in uh, Tanzania, um, dowry abuse in uh, India, uh, very difficult social problems to tackle. And they do very conclusive studies before and after these attitudes and people enrolling in programs. It works. If you do this right, it works. So am I hopeful? Yeah, I think we're on the verge of being able to do that here and make the same kind of real change that, that the, these kinds of programs have made. And what do you think that should be, what, what do you think creators should do? What do you think Hollywood should do to embrace this more? Well, I think they need to know that they have at hand a way of dealing with a problem. I mean, people like Joel are aware enough that they are fully cognizant of what they can do. But I can tell you an awful lot of showrunners and screenwriters think, well, it's a giant problem, but I can't write preachy shows about getting along. They don't know there's other things they can do to really make an impact. So first is educating our content creation brethren. Um, and um, that's number one. And then number two, just helping them understand the small changes they can make that have enormous downstream effects. Give examples of those. 
practically? Practically. Um, I think we, we talked about it a little bit, showing multidimensional characters, showing characters that have heated disagreements but don't end in a hated place and don't consider each other all this or all that. These are very small things, showing the characters that have more things in common. We did one on our show where a Muslim family moves down the street and the, the Roseanne character, this is pre-Connors, this was the before she blew herself up with the tweet. Um, <laughs> And um, she was suspicious of the Muslim family that moved in down the street. And it wasn't until she ran into the wife in the grocery store, and they were both using their EBT cards, and the Muslim wife was trying to buy a roasted chicken, and you couldn't buy prepared food with an EBT card. And they suddenly realized, oh, the fact that we're both poor is a lot, draws us together a lot more than the fact that we might have a different religion or other kinds of culture. We have more in common than we have apart. Showing that can be a very powerful thing because we don't focus on that. So as screenwriters, when you focus on that, it can be an eye-opening moment. What gives you hope? Well, the writer's strike is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And. And, that, and, and, and that's no small thing, because two weeks ago, it seemed like we were locked in an epic battle that some saw as a battle between good and evil. And it felt like it just couldn't be, it was a bridge that simply couldn't be crossed. And finally, people sat down and talked through their differences and figured out working solutions. And, you know, a bunch of us here are, um, are involved with uh, another organization. It starts with us. And that was started by uh, our friend Daniel Lebetsky. Mm -hmm. You're involved as well. Yeah, well. And, uh, you know, I worked with Daniel years ago uh, when he was starting another organization called One Voice, where we were focused on trying to bridge the divides in the Middle East. And if there's one thing I learned there, it's that you achieve nothing by focusing on past injustice. You achieve nothing by talking about what was done. If you want to make a difference today, you focus on working solutions. You, you focus on listening, and you open your heart to the fact that you may not be right. And I think you know I, everything you say is right in terms of characters, especially this notion of, of, of characters kind of coming into conflict and seeing how that conflict does or doesn't get resolved. And I think it's also okay if two characters never transform how they see each other. And ultimately, what matters is what's the audience's experience, right? What what is the audience left with, and what are we as storytellers saying through our stories? And you know I think we're not here just to entertain, that's important. Nothing works if we're not entertaining. But you know what, it's in its greatest moments, the reason to do what we do is that it can transform. It can nudge things just a little bit, it can move people. And so you hope that you're, you're moving them in the right place, in the right way. And in some ways in a world that is work from home, that is more isolated, that is more individualized on your screen, some of the normal social interactions of workplaces only take place on screens. Yeah. That we were talking earlier about how it's so hard to have pre-production through Zoom. I mean, sitting there, everyone's sort of looking at the wall and someone coming up with an idea, it's so hard to do when everyone's just sitting there. And, and the partial attention where you're watching someone's eyes and you're like, you're not even listening right now, you're reading an email. And people wearing glasses should know this, that we can see <laughs> what you're really looking at. And it's amazing to me that in this world of Zoom, people don't know that, that I can see that, that things are going across your eyes. But in a world of partial attention where people don't go into office places, one of the last places to model this is in scripted, unscripted situations where people are brought together. And so it's an almost a bigger responsibility because you're modeling a social life that has somewhat disappeared and has become more and more isolated. Talk a bit that's about a, that. That's a great point. Uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt, who you saw in the uh, video package, has written pretty extensively about this, that we have generations that um, don't have good conflict resolution skills for a variety of reasons. And um, I think we have to model that as well, that it's okay to feel uncomfortable. 
It's okay to have somebody you disagree with, get in a conversation, feel that that person's maybe never going to agree with you, continue it, and feel, and discomfort's okay. Discomfort is the price for democracy. And free and the price of being human. And the price of being human. And it's okay to shake hands and say agree to disagree, you know? Or to find, if you have to accomplish something together, that common ground that you can do it on to resolve the conflict. But we have, we have a chunk of our country that doesn't have those skills yet. So showing those skills in our uh, mass media is kind of important. Yeah, or showing the result of not having those skills sure. is, is equally power, can be equally powerful. Sure. We have a few minutes left. I would love to hear from you both sort of what you're working on now, if you could, with whatever you can share, that is trying to put some more hope connection out there. Oh, gosh. Um, well, we're conti I'm continuing to do The Connors. We're going into our sixth season, and we always try to do stories on that show that really highlight these disagreements that we have and show the kind of conversation that we can have. Um, uh, Nathan Walters at uh, Northwestern, we worked with an episode of the show to create a measure mm -hmm. of polarization. So when somebody watches a piece of mm -hmm. mass media programming, do they come away more polarized it, after seeing it or less polarized? You know, so we're starting, I think, to kind of figure out that there are real differences here when people watch this kind of programming. So uh, I'm continuing to do that with that show. Um, I develop other shows. I write with my son. We're working on stuff. Uh, and we always have in mind these kinds of social questions uh, of how we move forward from where we are now. So it's baked into everything we do. I also think of the intergenerational friendships, intergenerational connections in storytelling is so key yeah. that every generation feels so isolated. And whenever you bring these intergenerational, it's something we do in the East, it's just, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. So I, I love that you're creating I together. My son, he, he calls me on my old man shit, so that's... Oh my God, he looks at me. <laughs> okay, that's genetic at work. Wow. That's Corey. What are you working on? Well, first of all, since we're talking about family and intergenerational yes. stuff, I believe my mom is watching, and I want to say hi to her. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the, for, for the support of my parents. And really, you know, they were, they were civil rights movement leaders in their day, and those messages and that commitment and those sacrifices really is an inspiration in terms of what I do today, and uh, I hope to to make to make mom proud. And also, I think my kids, Dora, Josh, and Jessica, it's not my kid, but uh, my my better half. Uh, um, I'll be home tomorrow. Um, Writers and, never get to be on camera. This it's so like, true. I, mean, I know it's just what you all want to hear. But I, <laughs> but, I, but I, but here's what, it's so true. But, uh, and you can't, it's, unfortunately, you would normally just edit that out. I would. I would. I'm going to be totally like, oh, let's go. On I got one minute left. Let's go. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the connection is important because, um, you know, I, I can't really say what I'm doing next writing a movie that I'm not allowed to talk about, Joe and I working on a new TV series that I'm not allowed to talk about. I can't talk about anything. <laughs> um, but, but I will say, you know, I, I want to make my kids proud of what I do next, and I, and I want to make my parents proud of what I've done. And um, I, I think it, I feel very humble, and I feel very lucky to have been able to tell the stories that I've told. And, uh, you know, I... It, I feel like maybe if I if I hold on to that and you just keep trying to tell stories that are about real people in real struggles, then well, maybe the next one will be worthwhile too. And I'll say that when when we're at these lunches and we're sitting down with agents and we're at networks, I don't know anyone, and it's often with the door closed, hushed, that's not going through this. That's not going through this cousin who they lost touch with. And so as a community, there's what we have to put and show, and then there's what really is in the lives of these people. This is their jobs. And so I do feel like the intention of trying to help is there. 
And you know, I was I was yesterday. I was at a place I've not been to in years in LA. Um, and I remember I sat on that bench after I came out to my mother in '95 or '96, and it was before Will and Grace. And I remember thinking, well, if I lose my parents, what family will I have? Because the idea of getting married and having children of my own wasn't even a possibility. And then this cultural swell came with Will and Grace, and yeah. I'm now married, and I have two children, and I'm living a life that didn't even exist in my hope. And so I really do think for content, hope is so key. There's so much darkness that what you look for determines what you see. And if you put more hope out there, I think people will see more hope in their own lives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's so much reason to be hopeful, you know, as you were saying earlier, we're in a pretty good place. I know it feels like we're very divided, but look, gay marriage isn't just the law of the land, but pretty much liberal, conservative, this is just a, a wonderfully accepted thing. Uh, in you know, my mosque, Rachel, too, even when I have the same sex, yeah. I go to religious classes with my kids, I drop them off at the mosque, no one cares. Like, yeah. it's, it's such a change. We, we are actually much, much closer, yeah. much less divided than, than what is amplified would let us to believe. And, um, and I think that's important to hold on to as well. And, the, and what unites us, as, as we let go of these, these, these petty differences, the thing that unites us is our common human struggle. And fortunately for us as storytellers, that'll always be there, and, and that's always what's interesting to watch. Always. Okay, end of time, roll credits. We're good. <laughs>